This hearing shall come to order. For the record, the three tribunal panel members have been previously sworn, as have the tribunal court recorder, the translator, and the detainee's personal representative. Sir, you may be present at all open, non-classified sessions of your tribunal hearing. That is why you are here today. A reminder that if you become disorderly, you will be removed from the hearing and the tribunal will continue to hear evidence in your absence. You are also reminded that you do not have to testify, but you may if you wish. Prior to today's hearing, you provided a Muslim oath, and I remind you that any testimony you give today will be considered to be under oath to tell the truth. Please translate all that to the witness and ask him if he understands. No, I do not require a translator. I, I understand. Um, I can speak for myself and I wish to do so. I, I know that I am under oath both to you and to Allah. Very well then. Mr. Al Agar, Al Agar, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I have one question, concern, if I may ask. Yes, of course. For more than four years now, I have been a guest of your country here in Cuba, but I am not a guest, and this is not your country. I only ask this tribunal that you please make a decision. Make a decision and let me go home. This is why I have come here today. Very well. You may begin. The allegations forming the basis of the defendant's detention. Mr. Hassan Ali al Akar, while living in Pakistan and Afghanistan, associated with a known al-Qaeda cell and gave material support to an al-Qaeda operative. What have you to say to this allegation, Mr. Alakar? I cannot answer this allegation. You see, for four years I cannot answer this allegation because if you tell me the name of this person who is saying that I have helped al-Qaeda, who is this person? How can I answer this charge? Did you or did you not know anyone who was a member of al-Qaeda? No. No, I knew no one. You lived in Pakistan for three years, correct? Yes, three years and two months. And during that time, you traveled repeatedly into Afghanistan? Yes, yes, of course. Well, this is where the work I was overseeing was to be done. Your work involved overseeing the construction of a mosque and an Islamic social hall, correct? Yes. And in that time, those three years and two months, many of your associates were involved with money laundering and the purchase of guns and weapons for al-Qaeda. Is that correct? For four years, I have told the interrogators, I don't have any knowledge of this. Who is this person who is saying that I am involved in this? Tell me his name, and then maybe I can tell you if I know him. But I don't know if he's a terrorist. Maybe I know him as a friend. Maybe I know him as a member of my team, or he's somebody who worked for me. But I don't even know if this person is a Bosnian, or a Jordanian, or Saudi, or even one of your American Indians. Noting the dearth of American Indians working on the construction of mosques in the Middle East, sir, would you please answer my question? If you tell me his name, this person, then I can answer and defend myself against this accusation. Sir, we are asking the questions, and we need you to respond to what we ask and only what we ask. Let's move on. Before we proceed, if I may, mm -hmm. I'm curious. I'd like to know from the detainee where he learned to speak English so well. As I'm sure my file indicates, I learned to speak English both in my country and then uh, during my PhD training in England. You studied and worked in London during the 1990s, correct? Yes. This was a period of radical Islamic outreach into the mosques of London. I was not involved in any of that. But you knew it was going on all around you. Mr. Alakar, while in London, you worked for a Saudi engineering firm, correct? Yes, I was the project manager. And during those years, you attended two mosques of the Wahhabi sect? I did, but that is not a crime in your country that claims to defend religious freedoms. No, in our country, it's not a crime. But you weren't studying at radical mosques in our country, were you? Sir, I studied at no radical mosques anywhere. When I pray, I pray to rise closer to God. That, I find, is best done when I do not listen to the babble of men around me. Court recorder, please read into the record the next allegation. 
the detainee was arrested as he was attempting to plant and detonate a bomb at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad. That statement is untrue. I did not plan or do or even think any such thing. You are trained in explosives, correct? Yes, I am an engineer. I have studied demolition techniques. I have nothing to hide. Often it is the case that before we uh, build a new building, we have to tear down the old one first. Part of my job is to know how to do that. But learned judges, when I was arrested, did you find any explosives upon me? Did you find any weapons? Did you even find me standing there in front of your embassy? Mr. Alakar, your arrest took place before the bomb went off. One doesn't have to be storing explosives on his person or in his home to be a terrorist threat. I am prepared now to make you an offer. If you have any evidence, any proof, even very little proof, that I was standing in front of your embassy and I was going like that, then I am prepared to be punished. Punish me. But I can only say that I did not do any of these things and I am tired of repeating myself. Sir. I sympathize with your frustration. But I must ask you again to simply answer our questions and we can try to make this process as brief as possible. Brief, brief, I, I have been here for more than four years with no attorney, only this man that you have given me who is not a lawyer and who I cannot speak to confidentially because he must tell you everything I say. So what do I even have? I have these accusations. You tell me that I am Al-Qaeda, but I am not Al-Qaeda. But I have no way to prove this to you. Except go and ask Bin Laden. Catch him in his cave, ask him if I am Al-Qaeda. What should happen is that you should provide me with evidence. Prove these accusations. Because I cannot provide you with evidence of, of things I did not do. I can only say no, I did not do that. And that's it. Mr. Alagar, while I... It is not tonight. fair that I have lost more than four years of my life with my family. My girls were three and one year old when I came here. How will they know me now? How will I even be their father? How long do I have to sit here and suffer because somebody said that I am this thing or somebody said that I have some information? If you have any evidence to show me today, then please prove it and kill me and I don't mind. We appreciate your decision to participate. I, I want to participate. I, I have been completely honest. I, I, I want to make another statement. I was contacted by an attorney in the United States. Uh, she wrote me a letter and, and urged me not to participate in this hearing. But I said no. I said I want to participate because I want to show you my side, to show you that I am really innocent. Because the innocent, no matter how you try to cover up their innocence, their innocence will show through. Here's the part that puzzles me. We hear you, sir, claiming your innocence. But in all your protests, why is it you never answer our questions? You are a highly trained engineer with an impressive education, as well as experience and technical know-how regarding explosives and structural design. Yeah. You managed a work site employing a number of now known terrorists. Not to my knowledge. Well, so you claim, but they worked for you nonetheless. Do you know how many men we have working for us? I do not hire them. I'm not the foreman. I am an engineer. I design. I follow orders. These men are hired by others. So say you. You can contact my supervisors in Islamabad and they will attest to the fact that I do not hire these men. On two occasions, we put through your request to your supervisors to report to us by this tribunal date. Both requests emphasized this date, but we received no answer. Why? Why would, why would they not report? We want to know the same thing. And I also want to know this. You have a PhD from a prestigious university. You can work in nicer places near your family and make a considerable salary. But you chose, not someone else, but you yourself, you chose to work on a project far away from your family, who you now profess to care so much about. It was a religious calling. What does that mean? It means what it means. That's it. You have nothing more to say. 
what more would I say? I went there to help people. Just like in the West, you have missionaries that go out into the world to help people. We have the same thing. This organization, we went to pull people towards God to help people. I mean, look, I went to a poor country to build a mosque. If there were workers there who are Al-Qaeda, then please go after them. I am an engineer. That's exactly our question, sir. These men who worked for you, they were uneducated day laborers, correct? Yes, yes. How did these men, who lacked the training or the necessary engineering background, construct the sophisticated weapons that were found? Where, Mr. Alakar, did these men get the technical... Am I the only engineer in the entire country? Listen, I... When I was arrested, along with the others, we were bound, treated the Look, worst sir, treatment. Just please 36 the hours, sir, without food or water. I was shackled and beaten and brought all the way here to Cuba. And I told you at that time, I know nothing. And I'm telling you now, I know nothing. I cannot explain to you these that things. That still doesn't answer Excuse the question. Me, Colonel. Um, who beat you? Did you say you were beaten? They broke the fingers in my hand. I cannot close my hand. Are you saying a soldier here at Guantanamo broke your fingers? Sir, the soldiers, they, 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 they put me on the ground. They tied my hands and feet. They pushed my face into the rocks. Another soldier came and he put his knee in my face and he beat me. And then and the, the, the rocks, they, they flew into my eyes. If my head had been turned just a little bit more, I would have lost an eye. There are many, many things about the soldiers that I don't like to talk about. Did you report this? Hold on. Where is your proof of this allegation? Where is the proof? The pro Where is your proof of these accusations? There are classified reports which place you at the center of a bombing conspiracy. Where? Where is this classified documents? Why can I not see them? If there are documents that I cannot see, I do not want them to be used in this tribunal record against me. Unfortunately, sir, as you have been informed, under the rules of these tribunals, we are not allowed to show you the classified material against you. I don't want any documents that I cannot see to say if it is true or not to be used against me. I understand, but the classified documents have been classified by another government agency, and they have determined that releasing them to you may cause our country possible damage. There are national security precautions which prevent us from releasing our sources or providing any classified material that could assist a terrorist group in their attacks against us. Let me ask one question, please. Have you found anyone to be innocent? If not, then there is no need to continue because this, this is a joke. Mr. Alakar, these tribunals don't sentence people to guilt or innocence. This isn't a judicial proceeding, per se, but an administrative hearing to determine if you have been properly classified as an enemy combatant. So I must wait for another trial where nobody can tell me anything. I don't know when such a trial would take place nor at that time what evidence would be shown to you. My future has been destroyed, and this is all you can offer me. Mr. Alakar, I have a question. When the Pakistani police searched your house, they reported finding an AK-47 Kalashnikov in your residence. Yes. Yes, they did. What? I'm going to make war on the United States with one lousy AK-47? Everybody in Pakistan has a Kalashnikov. And Afghanistan too. Sadly, that is the reality of life in that part of the world. If a terrorist walks into a convenience store and buys a pack of cigarettes, then when he leaves, the convenience store owner is also a terrorist? Sir, we're not talking about a grocery store. This uh, organization you were working for, the Al-Najid Islamic Organization, Yes. is a suspected terrorist front. What? This is not, this, this is not true. This is not true. This is the first time I'm hearing of this. Why is this the first time I'm hearing of this? If this is true, then you should go after Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is the country that established the Al-Najid. Their president is a Saudi royal prince. While employed for Al-Najid, you worked with one Ali Al-Memza. Yes, yes I did. Indirectly, we were, uh, it was a humanitarian effort. We were to build a mosque and then a, a hospital in the north of the country, but we never finished the work before I was taken. Why? What does... What does Ali al memza have to do with this? What? This humanitarian organization of yours is merely a cover to mask travel and activities of terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. 
this is not true. This is not the work I saw. This is a, a humanitarian organization. It is a, a helping the Muslims, the ulma. It is a missionary organization. A missionary organization. Yes. Look, if there are people who are using this organization for terrorist activities, then you go after them and you kill them. But I have been here for four years and nobody, no interrogator, no one has ever mentioned any of this to me. So why am I hearing this now? Why is it just coming out now? Sir, you were the second highest ranking official in the organization's Afghan division at that time. Look, if America is determining that uh, th th this organization was a front for Al-Qaeda, then fine. Uh, prove that there were terrorists there, go after them, kill them. I don't care. I have nothing to do with this. Do you believe in jihad? I believe in Islam. Do not dissect Islam. I'm not. I want to state for the record that I am trying to be respectful. All I'm asking is, do you believe in jihad? I cannot answer this question. This is a mysterious question to me. I cannot answer it. What is the meaning of jihad to you? To me, the meaning of jihad is many things. It could mean helping someone like the Prophet. Or it could mean fighting injustice, like when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and the people in that country rose up to defend their country. Don't think that when you're talking about jihad, you're always talking about somebody killing somebody. Then what does it mean? It could mean somebody helping somebody. Building roads, schools, hospitals, all of these are part of the jihad. So when I went to Afghanistan and Pakistan, I went there just to do the humanitarian part of the jihad. Jihad does also include killing people, correct? Yes, it does. But not for me. We understand that this is a difficult process and we appreciate your cooperation. Do you have anything further to add? No. We will adjourn this open session with the comment that I would like to make to the detainee, that we will consider these matters carefully and make our determination accordingly. Take a seat. You want one? Uh, no, thank you, sir. I don't smoke. Smart. These things get more and more expensive every damn day. I read your file. You just got back from Iraq. Yes, sir. And then thanks for your loyal service. They reward you with Gitmo. How fresh is that coffee? Just arrived. Thank God. I've been dying for some since the hearing started. Imagine how the detainee felt. I would have shared. OK. Let's proceed. The question before us is whether the detainee has been properly classified as an unlawful enemy combatant. The government's declaration contains the classified evidence against the detainee, linking him to a number of terrorist acts. Bomb making, explosives trading, leading to the deaths of over 40 US soldiers, plus two attempted bombings of US embassies. This is a hell of a report. Question. The tribunal rules allow us to consider hearsay and even confessions given under torture, correct? That's correct, if you find that it's reliable. Well, that's my question. Seeing as this is my first tribunal, how exactly do we determine the reliability of the evidence? On what basis? This is my third tribunal, Captain. When I figure that out, you'll be the first to know. We look at the totality of the circumstances. Does the evidence match up with the other facts? Who was the witness? Was there really any torture, or is it all just a story? Which happens? What did the detainee do or say that corresponds with the classified evidence? Just use your common sense. So in this case? In this case, the captured informant knew the detainee's name, his address in Afghanistan, his engineering background, 
Couple that with a declaration from our own intelligence services. All of which fine. the detainee had no chance to respond to, because as an alleged enemy combatant, he's not allowed to see or confront the classified evidence against him. It's the same rule that all detainees must Excuse face. me, Colonel. So we have this informant who's maybe being tortured, and he might be naming names to stop that. And we're supposed to evaluate this tortured informant? Allegedly confession. tortured informant. I think what the captain is asking, if I may, is without meeting or interrogating this allegedly tortured informant, how do we determine what really happened? And then without knowing any of those details, how do we make a determination of what is reliable evidence and what is bullshit? Not my words exactly, but uh, yes, sir. Richard, please. This is a deliberation, Carol. I'm deliberating. Look, Captain, our orders and procedures are very clear. We're not assigning guilt or innocence. We're simply trying to make sure that the detainees have been properly classified as unlawful enemy combatants. Yes, but if classified as such, doesn't that mean that the detainee can be kept here until the president decides that the war on terror is over? Whenever that may be. Yes, technically. And that's not a guilty sentence to you? This is getting really hard to stomach. The UCMJ clearly states... The Uniform state, Code of Military Justice is not in play here. It's why it was created. It was created before Al-Qaeda decided to fly planes into skyscrapers. Congress approved the rules of the Combatant Status Review Tribunals. Plus, there's the classified evidence against this detainee. Oh, okay, but in the Hamdi decision, didn't the Supreme Court say that the government's classified evidence there was highly suspect? Yes, the court said it amounted to little more than a bunch of bu Excuse me. Unsubstantiated hearsay. Hamdi was an American citizen. This is completely different. Because this man is not a U.S. citizen? How do we claim the moral high ground if we don't treat everybody the same, just as we expect our own people to be treated? Whoa. Don't start comparing these tribunals to the terrorists and their tactics. Horrible things were done in Abu Ghraib. I won't deny that. But seriously, that is just a very small sampling of our troops and our mission. It's not just Abu Ghraib. If these detainees weren't Islamic extremists before they got to Guantanamo, what is locking them up here for four or five years turning them into? What are we creating here? You're measuring us doing stress positions or playing loud rap music all night to the terrorists with their beheadings and their mass executions and their blowing up markets and trains filled with children. I, I don't see a comparison, Richard. Why is that the comparison? Why don't we measure our behavior against who we say we are and tell ourselves we are as a country? That's a little simplistic after 9-11, don't you think? Okay. If 9-11 is the measuring stick, are we a great nation because of the blow we took or because of how we as a country respond to that blow? The response matters. Our response defines us. But we're not the ones who get to decide that message. You say you want us to behave by the book? Well, the Constitution expressly puts the power of these foreign policy decisions into the hands of the elected president. And if the policy goes against the Constitution and the Uniform Code of Military Justice? Oh, don't get all high and mighty, Richard. You have no authority to decide what's constitutional or not. Hell, the Supreme Court can't even come up with a defining doctrine on all this. That's not true. Look at Razul. Look at Hamnan. The Supreme Court is clearly troubled by this whole process. As it is now, the detainees don't get a lawyer. They don't get to see the key evidence against them. Forget the UCMJ. This goes against the Magna Carta. Congress legitimized these tribunals when they passed the Military Commissions Act. The law on this is perfectly clear. The courts have no jurisdiction in this. The court has no say in the law. This doesn't sit wrong with you? No. We can go round and round, but that doesn't change the facts. Our detainee's complete unresponsiveness to our questions. Coupled with the way he danced around his views on jihad, plus the classified evidence, please, this builds a very compelling case against this man. You found him completely unresponsive. Yes, I did. Agreed? No. But I do wish we had something more substantial to go on, particularly if we don't know the reliability of the classified evidence we do have. You have to admit, Carol, this is pretty flimsy. Plus, we also have to consider who turned Alakar over to U.S. forces. He wasn't captured on the battlefield. Uh, according to the classified report, the Northern Alliance turned him over in exchange for a bounty from the U.S. military. Exactly. $10,000 for every alleged Taliban member and $25,000 for every alleged Al-Qaeda fighter. No questions asked. It's a fortune over there. It ain't a bad day over here either, Colonel. The Northern Alliance was our ally in Afghanistan, gentlemen. This is not a criminal trial. I mean, I wish we had the luxury of calling in witnesses and watching undercover videos where our defendant is shown actually assembling the bomb. It would be great if we did. Hell, I'd pop the popcorn. But we got a war going on here. Two wars, actually. 
and we do not have the luxury of perfect due process. Is a somewhat thorough investigative process a luxury? In the war zone, where our troops are being shot at and blown up every day? And what about the danger of releasing possible classified information? So all this is the best, worst possible solution? Those aren't my words, Captain, but yes. But how is the detainee supposed to prove something when he doesn't even get to see the evidence against him? Well, the detainee is still presumed innocent. True, but with this cockamamie tribunal logic, the classified evidence against the detainee, which the detainee can't see, remember, is presumed to be correct without question. So doesn't that poison the basic presumption of innocence? Captain, you just got back from Iraq, didn't you? You saw what's going on over there. This car bomb went off just inside the green zone. A couple American contractors got killed, and because somebody knew somebody, I was sent to get the bodies released from the morgue. There was this uh, young Iraqi woman there pleading with some bureaucrats. So I asked my translator to find out what was up. He tells me that her husband died in a different car bombing a couple days earlier, but because she was Sunni and the bureaucrats were Shiite, they were given her problems releasing the body. I talk to my contacts, push the paperwork through. Then I find out that she still can't get the body back to her hometown because she can't get through all the different tribal neighborhoods safely. I arrange for a Humvee to escort them back. Now you have a U.S. Humvee with a dead Iraqi guy on top. They hit another IED. And a U.S. soldier dies. Another loses an eye. We never found anything from the dead Iraqi guy but the joke was that he got blown up twice. And your point, Captain? I was hoping things would make more sense back here. I'm not sure what weight, if any, to give to a confession that maybe or allegedly comes from torture, but there are these coincidences. A PhD engineer working for a terrorist front, maybe he doesn't know anything, but maybe he does. But is that enough? Who the hell knows? Colonel, I just wish we had more. But we don't, and we're not going to. Are you willing to take a chance on letting a terrorist bomb maker walk away? Are you willing to keep him locked up based on suspect evidence he can't even hear? If we're fighting an ideological war, shouldn't we be holding on to an idea worth fighting for, say, like the Constitution or the rule of law? We are compelled to make the best decision we can under the laws we've been given. Obviously, there's not a perfect solution. The imperfection of the process does not require us to overlook the imperfection of the evidence, and this, this is all we have to hold him potentially for the rest of his life. There are just too many shortcuts being taken. I'm compelled to vote no. I respectfully disagree. This is not an intellectual debate. Our responsibility is clear, and the risks are not imaginary. There is more than enough to classify this detainee properly and legally. OK. One for, one against. So it's up to you. Take your time, Captain. We'll be outside. Today's Theater for Ideas, Torture the American Way, with Amnesty International and Theater for Ideas takes full responsibility for the content of this hour. So uh, I want to introduce Chris, as I just said, my brother, who's written a dissertation about the Iraq War. Uh, wonderful dissertation. He's trying now to get published as a book. He's now a doctor, so congratulations. He's also an activist. He's going to talk a lot to you today about his experiences being arrested, beaten, hauled off to jail 
for expressing his right as an American citizen to protest and dissent. And Eve Bratton, who's a nurse with BA Hospital, but I know Eve from Matthew 25, which she helped to start, a free medical clinic, and then more recently the Ask Medical Clinic, which ended in a tragic way with shrouded in mystery and uh, no explanation as to why that clinic closed. And uh, so what we're talking about today, you just saw a 30 minute show put on by Amnesty International called The Response, which brings up issues about what kind of country is America. And one of the people said, talked about the high moral ground. How can we claim to be, have the high moral ground? So what we want to talk about, because torture is not debatable, uh, we know our country is torturing people in various locations around the world. They use the justification, I guess, that it gets information against terrorism, etc. But one of the things we want to talk about, or the main thing is, what are the values of our country that allow torture to flourish like this? A country that prides itself on being open and honest and noble and better than any other country morally and uh, clearly. Torture, wars, lack of health insurance, uh, the oil spill, which was just brought about by contempt, uh, and now sending thousands of people homeless and foreclosures, I could go on and on. But anyway, uh, Chris just opened with a stanza from a song he's written called The American Way. He's going to play the whole song later. And another song called Dope Smokers of the World Unite. And I think we're going to go out on that. Unite and take over. Okay. Let me get the whole title. <clears throat> Thank you. So anyway, uh, Chris, why don't you start with some of your, uh, well, whatever you want to start with. I know you've been to, arrested in New York, Seattle, the world famous protest in Seattle, New York, uh, Miami. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, I'd like to start. Thank you for having me on the show. And I think a, a good place to start is to recognize that we're, in terms of torture, in terms of genocide, in terms of, in a very unfortunate American way, we sit on indigenous land, Miami land, um, an indigenous village, Kikianga, that was systematically. Uh, wiped out so that you know the uh, American settlers could could have this land and I think that until we recognize our history and recognize the reality um, those values can't change and there's certainly a lot of good things about America and certainly a lot of good things about a relative to a Western nation state that has a constitution that supposedly protects free speech bars torture provides uh, criminal trials, etc. But the reality is that when that state is threatened in any way, or if it's convenient for that state to do so, it will participate and originate and continue to torture and do uh, the things that you listed at the beginning. Uh, I'm certainly interested in terms of what, you know, at a local level, um, you know, Eve's work and, and the broader issue of this issue of values and the issue of values relative to uh, by any definition, a very troubling time in American history. We have to recognize that American history, we're talking about a country that's only over 200 years old versus other cultures that have survived for thousands of years. And I think uh, I wouldn't be outrageous if I was a betting person to say that it's not going to be around for another 100 years. So what is it about our values, as Terry articulated at the start, that uh, leads us to this predicament of, of so many social ills, yet so much incredible wealth and, and disparity? Very well said. As I said in the opening, Eve is, I think, a great humanitarian. I mean, she has devoted herself to trying to help people who don't get help. The poor people, the marginal people, the voiceless people, through free health clinics. And uh, that's why I asked Eve to be on the show, because somebody with a heart like hers, how, how does this make you feel? to know that our country is torturing people in the name of, I guess, in the name of justice. Well, uh, we have sort of a dichotomy. We say that we're a country of God-fearing people, that we um, Christian values, and in many ways we do. But oftentimes the value of um, the dollar gets above the Christianity 
that is the, the values. Yeah, it, yeah, the it is. And so often the policies are the God of dollar <coughs> as opposed to God in heaven or God of all. And um, and as as he was first was saying, is the founding of our country. We um, I just heard just last week. Um, what the soldiers were called who went to the West to fight the Indians, the Native Americans. Because there was someone who showed me an article in the newspaper in 1930 of how these soldiers were trying to get some pensions. They were called Winners of the West. Winners mm -hmm. of the West. Winners of the West. Everything is, you know, everyone puts a title on, on something. You know, mm -hmm. They gave a different name to make it more appealing. Winners of the West, it was called, and to make it more pleasing to hear and, and um, so. Well, it casts them as heroes. That's right. You know, American heroes. Winners of the American. West as opposed to removing the Native Americans from the land and confining them to reservations and deserts. Well, yeah. when you're but, noble, you can do no wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's and just so like the logic sort of follows that, well, we're noble, so therefore what we do yeah. is some noble act. Collateral yeah, yeah. casualties. Mm. Exactly. Instead True. of this number of people getting killed, collateral casualties. And I think that, um, I think it's very important to everyone to realize that it begins with yourself and how yeah. you respond to people. That if you make a conscious effort to hurt somebody, to make, to do something wrong, that you kind of taint your soul. And it's easier for you to do that. For instance, if you classify a, a certain population of being dirty, being ignorant, declassifying them, it, it's easier to make yourself better and easier for you to put those people down. Mm. And so you gradually continue on that way to dehumanize, and then it's easier to do something horrible against these people because they're no longer human. Yeah. They are you know, below right. us, below. And, and Gandhi had this great line. He said, to do great evil, you must first convince yourself you're doing great good. Mm. I love and that. And you do that yeah. by changing, right? By, for instance, the, the citizens of Vietnam, what do they call gooks? Or, you know, you, call, you name well, people. Indians to are savages. Savages. Um, you, you um, define these people so they and are different. Yeah, Iraqis defending their country are insurgents, but Americans defending their country are uh, Minutemen, heroes. I, I mean, it, it's all... And, and if you go back to the Revolutionary War, we were um, under England's control. Were we, were we terrorists or were we revolutionists? You know? <laughs> there you go. I know. Yeah. You know, it, it's the way of looking at, at <laughs> yeah, something. It's who's in charge, who's in power. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because it would be very a radical group to say we're going against our government, as yeah. happened in England, which all, you know, I'm yeah. glad we're not under English control. But I mean, it's all the way of naming things. Exactly. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to follow a little bit with the Revolutionary War in that context of, you know, America's land of the free. And the context of the Revolutionary War was that, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, for those of you who want to kill me for suggesting that perhaps England would have been a better victor of the war, uh, the reality is that the English offered to free the slaves. You know, fr slaves that fought on the side of the English were offered, um, were, were freed. Uh, so essentially had this uh, emancipation from the British uh, in terms of their rule. And you also had, the British had uh, demarcated the western boundary of the colonies and said that, you know, further to that western boundary is Indian land and we're not going to essentially usurp it, we're not going to invade, we're not going to, to do anything, and that's Indian land. And so a major motivation, certainly of the founding fathers, who were large landowners, was that, and they offered soldiers the option, okay, if you fight, we'll open up this Indian land and you'll get free land. So, again, in terms of freedom, in terms of liberty, can we really say that was the greatest start uh, in terms of a war, fighting for liberty and freedom? And the other context, of course, is that the Constitution, once they established this freedom, American history has been a fight of people of whatever race, color, ethnicity, background to be part of that Constitution. So originally, white males are property. 
I don't think you can really say that's the greatest aspect of liberty to start off a country. Women weren't included, blacks weren't included, freed blacks weren't included, uh, Indians certainly weren't included. So, you know, our, our ideology, it's great to talk about freedom, and it's wonderful to be able to sit here and be part of this show and express ourselves, because I have been in, in countries where it's not possible. However, I question whether if this show actually was directly threatening the government in some way, whether we would be sitting here, because uh, perhaps I'll have an opportunity to elaborate the opportunities where I've been participating in large-scale protests, which directly threaten the government, that were not tolerated. Yes. Exactly. Put it mildly. You know, getting back to Eve's point about our Christian nation and the founding of the country, you know, the two words that were used, manifest destiny, just the height of arrogance, you know, that America is so important and so superior to every other race that it's our duty. And it wasn't just that God said it's okay, as I understand it, they said God told them to do it. You know, it's a duty. Mm. It's a duty to kill the Indians. And I'm just reading this wonderful book, uh, The Last Stand, uh, about Custer and Sitting Bull. And, you know, the guys like Custer were, that, that's the way they could advance, by killing Indians, really. I, I mean, and, and this torture discussion is just still, things haven't, changed after all these years, really. I mean, there's still the arrogance, they're still using God to justify terrible evils, uh, invasions of countries. Uh, you know, I've read that people actually say God does not want Americans to have health care. I'm sure it's in the Bible <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> oh, wacky God. <laughs> see that but uh see i think it all comes if, if you follow your christian faith and believe that all are equal yes all are in the i all are in the image of god that we all belong to the grape and the vines and i mean you you can't go that way you can't you i mean you have to see people all people as that and and i think that is the hardest thing for for us then to take young men young women who have been brought up to not fight, to um, be nice to other people, and um, to share, and then send them off to faraway places to do the opposite, and yeah, then the and, and then opposite. and then to come back home and do you know transform themselves again into loving individuals. Yeah, and it doesn't work. I mean, so many people and. I'm Sure, the VA hospital is probably full of veterans who are experiencing that trauma of being trained to do one thing, horrible thing, to other people, and then come back and supposed to be, you know, a, a functioning American and, and go as if nothing happened in between from be, before when they left to to when they got back, and it doesn't work that way. You know, I really believe so much that America is obsessed with status, which is being more important than other people, being more powerful than other people. You know, in a re very recent example of that, uh, the, I forget the guy, I think the Simpsons, or a senator named Simpson or Simpson or something like Simpson. that. Simpson. Yeah. The guy actually says, and he's old himself from the looks of it, uh, <laughs> He said that people that get Social Security, I guess he's arguing that you shouldn't get Social Security. It's only the most popular social program in, in the country. One that, that works, mm -hmm. doc, definitely works. He called the people getting Social Security lesser people, lesser people. Just like that oil guy says, oh, we care about the small people. As soon as you make that distinction, I'm big, they're small, you don't care about them, or you wouldn't call them small to begin with. Because ultimately in America, the myth of America is that everyone has the ability to rise themselves up. So clearly, if you're not rising yourself up, there's something wrong with you. You're a lesser person, you're a small person, whatever the case may be. I hope the country is waking up to the fact that fundamentally the system does not work. There's so many people unemployed without health insurance who don't have pensions who don't have adequate means of uh, survival, even via Social Security, et cetera, it, it just clearly does not work. 
uh, in the level of debt, and I believe we're headed for a very, very tremendous uh, hard fall. And I think we need to determine, and these discussions are very useful, what, is, what are we going to create out of the, the chaos? Some would argue the chaos is already here. Uh, it's not as prevalent as perhaps in other places, but uh, it doesn't look, the, the future looks very challenging. Well, the, uh, Eve, you had said something before we went on the air that about the schools, you know, schools closing with uh, billions, probably trillions of dollars spent on war, un unnecessary wars, uh, and yet schools close. I just read where Detroit's practically, their public school system's practically closing down. Now, we're not saying, you know, are schools good or bad? I mean, public schools have their problems. But my gosh, almost everybody you talk to will say, well, the answer to all this is good education. So you can't even have any education without some kind of school uh, funded by the government. I mean, is, is the United States government only exists to fund wars? You know, we've talked to members of the Tea Party, for example, and oh, they're all against this this debt. You know, this big debt. Also worried about the debt. So if you pay for things like with the entitlement programs, the another branding word, entitlement. Bankers are entitled to bonuses, but we're not entitled to Social Security or health insurance. You know. Oil companies are entitled to spill millions of oil out in the ocean, pollute the water, kill the animals, threaten the whole way of life on the Gulf Coast. But So rich people are entitled, but we're not. But my point is they have no problem with the war, <laughs> which is the single by far biggest form of spending. No problem with that, but boy, anything that actually will benefit Americans, like health insurance, better schools, uh, jobs, oh my gosh. And no, because we have freedom of the individual. You know, the individual has to take care of that and, and all it, that kind it, of it reminds me of an article that um, was written maybe 10 years ago in which um, the Indiana state government was trying to figure out how many jails they're going to need in oh, 20 yeah. years. So what they did is they did a study of the four-year-olds to see um, those children, by their behavior, who would be in jail by the time they're 18 or 20. <laughs> and I, and my, my one thought was, okay, so you've identified the children that may cause problems. Why not put some resources there to prevent that from happening. Which would, well, would be far less expensive than sending them than to the jail. Than building jails if they this already is, know which four-year-olds are going to be causing problems. This is one of Chris's problems. favorite points. Yeah, and I, I think I can answer that, and the answer is profit. The answer is that we have gone from 1980 to 2003, a quadrupling of the prison population in this country. In recent 2010, I think the figures I'm citing are 2006, 3% of the population, American population, is either in prison, in, on parole, on probation, but in the criminal justice system. This is a phenomenal amount of people and phenomenal relative to a quote unquote free country. If I were to say that uh, a certain country had the largest prison population of any country in the world, if I was to say a certain country had the largest per capita prison population in the world, usually people vote or suggest countries, China maybe, uh, Iran, uh, but it's the United States. And this, again, in terms of barometer of freedom and liberty and free speech, et cetera, freedom, I, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, you know, the, yeah. It is so skewed in terms of the dichotomy. And the relative to that quadrupling the prison population, what's happened since 1980, and particularly under Clinton in the 1990s, was that we had the private infrastructure, privatization of prisons, which essentially meant that they are for profit. And so if you're running a yeah. prison, you, you know, the state is paying you money, and what's your interest? Is your interest to have less crime and to have fewer people in prison? No, your interest, <laughs> and to generate profit, is to have more people in prison. How do you do that? You participate in the constitutional process as a corporation, and you give money to candidates who will promise to be tougher on crime. What kind of crime are we talking about? The kind of crime I'll sing about at the end of the show, 
people who are, have drug possession, uh, marijuana, cocaine, you know, whatever. But essentially, these are, and I'm not sure if you'll agree, but most health uh, professionals reckon, and I'm not, sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> start an argument in case you do disagree, <laughs> but uh, my understanding is that the view is widely held that this is a health issue, not a criminal issue. But again, the money that's generated from putting people in jail is, has become a cash profit en enterprise. So instead of a criminal justice system, we have a system that actually there is an embedded interest in putting people in prison because it generates profit. So. I'll try to conclude, but my single view of American society and constitution and what can change is this issue of corporations having the same rights as people. In the original constitution, it was presented, people fought to have a Bill of Rights, and I think we all can all be proud of that Bill of Rights to a degree. That Bill of Rights was then fought for by uh, blacks in terms of overcoming slavery, uh, women, uh, a whole range of people to be included in that constitution recognized by that Bill of Rights. Corporations have been recognized as people and are protected under that Bill of Rights and so by that judgment they have access to the political system and can donate money and create a prison system that is based on profit rather than based on justice. So my if all the audio goes off and the cameras stop, my <laughs> main theme is that relative to existing American structure and society, corporations should not be able to participate in the political system. And yet they own the political sure, system. Right, because, thank you. <laughs> and the recent Supreme Court decision giving them unprecedented power in the political uh, process corporations, it should be called America the Corporation, not America, America the Inc. Country. America Inc. and Congress, members of Congress are the shareholders. They do not represent us. I mean, and imagine voting for a guy who would say something like, people who get Social Security are lesser people. Now, judging from his picture, he's probably eligible to collect Social Security. But do senators collect Social Security? No. See, it gets back again to the status. They're more important. So they aren't even in the Social Security system. So they lose nothing if they shut it all down. They get their salary for life when they retire or get arrested and put in jail which happens quite frequently, uh, or they, they resign in disgrace, like uh, Mr. Souter and uh, I'd say Evan Bai too, Evan Bai's wife getting all that money from WellPoint uh, uh, and, and the criticism he was receiving. And anyway, uh, it, it's, it's very troubling. And to think that people vote for guys like that, that that's what gets me. I mean, it, 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 apparently somebody actually went and said, oh, I'm going to vote for this guy who wants to get rid of Social Security. Yeah, I, quite a few people did. did yeah, elected, yeah. Senator and I, I think he's been senator a long time. I think that word lesser uh, just says so much because they said status and we're more important. And once you, as Eve said at the beginning, once you get that mindset that you're more important that your dreams matter more than the dreams of this person over here, your neighbor, you're on your way to just do, justifying the most horrible things from torture to invading a country to not giving people health insurance. You know, we hear the word terrorists all the time and the rationale, well, these are terrorists, these are nasty people. Well, we, we got to torture them because, you know, if we don't, they're going to destroy our country and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, what are the 45,000 Americans every year who die from lack of health care? What are they? Are they terrorists? They seem to be. I mean, that seems to be the, I mean, they aren't. I'm talking about what the people have the power view them. I, I think that um, in regards to the national health care issue, you have to realize that the, the people, the profit, spent $1 million a day to, to fight against health care. And so mm. you get these, the insurance company spent that much because the CEO of Anthem, they make $500,000 a week. $500,000 a week. And how do they get that money by denying health care to other people? It's like if somebody is sick, you have this middle person decide, yes, you'll get health care, you don't get health care. I think it's, it's um, 
because I, I think the million dollars a day was very effective because even the people without health insurance that, you, that I would talk to said, oh, no, we don't want national health insurance. That's socialism. Somebody else is going to make up. Somebody it's else, words again. It's <laughs> words again. And, and somebody else is going to decide who my doctor is or when I can go. It's already but, happening. It's already happening. Yeah. The, the insurance company has already decided yeah. who you're going to see and, um, and when you're going to see yeah. this person and what kind of test you're going to be and when you have to leave the hospital because your insurance isn't going to cover it anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's already happening. It's been, done, it's been done by not the government, but by this industry. Mm. And when you have a corporate control of media where most people get their information, you can then buy access that media and just hammer that message. Socialism, socialism, socialism. Can yeah, label, most, label, label. Most mm -hmm. people cannot label, articulate label. why that is bad, mm -hmm. uh, but, but they know it's bad because they've been, somehow they, they've, they understand it's bad. Uh, you can program, literally program people to be opposed to things that are in their own interest. And yeah, see exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and we're going to do, wait, I'm sorry, there is a show on health care. Yeah. That, right. And so there will be a theater for ideas on health care, I believe, in July, uh, which I believe I'm a, a yeah. <laughs> either I'm inviting myself as a guest no, now you're, or I am you're on. a you guest come. And, and talking about the Australian health care system, which is, uh, you know, socialized, whatever you want to call it, but it works very, it very twice. well. But it is, again, labeling things, labeling issues, mm. um, making it so that there's something wrong with it. So it's got this name to it. it, it yeah. That's yeah. how you that's how you dehumanize it or, or um, uh, make yeah. it bad by, make it by bad, calling yeah. Yeah. something uh, else. And, and like parks. The best things about America, parks and libraries, socialism, yeah. the most and necessary things, police and fire department, socialism. I'd argue about police, but... Well. And what they are doing now is taking, they've successfully just ground to dust the term liberal. And now, the, our friends in, I shouldn't, our friends in the Tea Party and, and on the right are tr going after the term progressives and progressivism, as if that's the, the problem for all of America's ills, is that somehow progressives have forced the government to give entitlements you know, to poor people who don't deserve it, and which so is laughable yeah. when you actually yeah. experience society in other, other first, quote unquote, first world countries where you actually have benefits, well, you actually have national health care, you actually have national unemployment benefits, etc. Uh, and, then, and then to think that, oh my God, the United States is spending so much money on entitlements and social services where it's laughable because there's hardly anything relative to what it should be spending. And all this angst against health care, the same angst was against Social Security, the same angst especially against women voters. I mean, how long did it take women to get the right to vote? 75 years. Mm. No, a little bit longer than that because it was started with... Yeah, I think it's 1820. I think 1820. Yeah. So it yeah. took 100 years to get the women to vote. I think it was 1816, wasn't it? That mm. Anyway, but approximately yeah. 75 to 100 and years. And a lot of angst and, and name-calling and labeling. So um, all the quote unquote yeah, progress of the United States has been because of thinking or thinkers yeah. and progressives yeah. moving things yeah, along it, to it, better it, people. It, it, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a country where the value was that, okay, we, we absolutely have to provide everyone with health care. How do we do it? Instead of the opposite, which is that, oh, people don't have health care is kind of a problem, but uh, how do we make sure they don't get it right. so we can <laughs> feel superior? If, we, if you have it and if I have it and you don't, I feel superior yeah. to you. The you story know? of England, if we go back on health care, it was after World War II and everyone was so devastated and, and impoverished and bombed and that they just thought it was a right of the people as a mass that they needed to do something. And so even though they were poor, they were bombed, they were uh, even trying to get food, they developed the health care system because they mm. wanted to make sure it was shared with all. Mm. Yeah. Well, the, England, Australia, France, you know, and you hear these people actually say, oh my God, we don't, you want America to turn into England? You know, where nobody's well, ever lost a home due to foreclosure for medical bills. In America, it's like every 30 seconds or something. I don't want to be quoted on that. It's probably not right, but it's, it's an amazingly horrible yeah. figure. Well, well, you don't have to take it out 
outside of this city, people are dying because of lack of health care. Yeah, talk people. about a little bit about why you, there is such a need for like the Ask Clinic. I mean, what what uh, needs for a free health clinic? Our, our free health clinic are are just to provide the basic needs for people because right now, if um, for instance you were having chest pains, what which you I've had. you yeah, which you've had, you had insurance and go. But I I know I've worked with several people that. Um, they were having chest pains, and I had to argue with them to go to the hospital and point they were in tears. And you're thinking, you don't, the, these people need to go to the hospital because they're having chest pains, but they're refusing because they don't want to lose their house. And that's a reality. One woman told me she would rather die than, um, than go to the hospital and lose her house because her house belonged to her family. What and a she choice. didn't and yeah. she is wasn't going and and it's it's so unbelievable that that I'm in this situation arguing with a woman who's having chest pains to go to the hospital yeah and that's and, torture i mean that yeah. lady was yeah. suffering yeah. intense emotional and it was just torture. not one lady it was two ladies there were many mm -hmm. more than but yes. enough people in that situation let's yeah. say and, well, and she's not alone yes. yeah no not alone at all and what kind of Again, we can sit here. Uh, yeah, it was interesting watching the the film, the documentary, because they're kind of like going into the nuances of it. But ultimately, what kind of society produces a healthcare system where the fundamental issue of healthcare, private healthcare, is it's that not if you're available. is that well, if you're a private healthcare provider, it is in your interest for people not to ha get access to healthcare. Yes, it's like. Yeah, again, what's wrong with this picture? It just, it, it's completely and nonsensical and counterintuitive and counterproductive. And it's so, anything to get a dollar. It's any kind right. of maneuver. And I will give you my story, is every woman has to have an annual pap test. Okay, fine. I got my provider. My provider was in the group for this <laughs> insurance. In the group. In the group, in the web. So I go, and in I get the, a bill for... Sorry, in the net. In the, in the net. net. That's yeah. what it is. Yes. In the net. So I go, have it done. And then I get a bill for $150, and I say, what is this? It's called the insurance. Um, yes, my, my provider was in the net. It's for my sales. The sales was taken to a laboratory that was not in the net. So that means, <laughs> so that, that means that if you're having a test, it, it, you need to say, where is that t sample going, or where is this test going to be uh, done? Wh and why because otherwise, be you are you are going to be charged, and um, they're out of it because, for some reason, I didn't tell them that this was a net for the lab, which I did not know that there was a separate. Oh, well, you get these. to keep track of that, and I you're sick. Uh, you're, you're on top sick of. This is I'm healthy, so I can argue with it. But I mean, well, I sure. didn't. But, but I that, was think if you're sick, like that lady mm -hmm. with chest pains, and then you're trying to decipher all this on top of being sick, on top of worrying how you're going to pay for and it. And figuring you out don't have about all the different tests that you're having done, all the different x-rays, that, that it goes to the agency or the facility uh, that it's supposed to go to. Otherwise, you're going to pay full price. And um, at one time, people did say, oh, I'm not going to have insurance. I'm going to set aside a certain amount of money in my account. Sorry, I didn't mean in, in my account to take care of any health care needs. But that's impossible anymore because you can go to the hospital, something's drastically wrong, and have an $800,000 bill very shortly. Oh, abs yeah. absolutely. But and you cannot figure the bills out. Yeah. I've uh, had quite a bit of experience with hospital bills recently. And they come in, they come from different sources. You can't even figure out what they're for. They have codes that. Uh, and you'll see charges for things that you never even talk to directly. Like I had tests for my heart, so I've had heart problems, so very important to me. Uh, I never did actually talk to whoever read the test, but you get a bill and they get $500 for reading the results. It take them five minutes, an hour, and I still don't know. I mean, they said, oh, you're fine, which, well, okay, great. But what's that mean? I mean, I didn't really get to sit down or even get a letter or anything from yeah. Well, this is a good point to have Chris uh, sing The American Way, the okay. title just of the, of the, get the, guitarist of just the show. The yeah. a little bit. Um, I but I was just thinking of all the money that we send to insurance companies that could be used for health care. 
there, to provide there, the basic health care for there everybody. Is, as a friend said, there is no reason for health insurance companies to exist. None, zero, except to rake in money. Yeah. You, they do not provide a service that couldn't be, be far better provided by other people but, but or other companies. You know, it's interesting in terms of indoctrination. You think, well, what could what could put someone in a position? You're in the army and you're put in, you're in this little room with this person who's from a foreign country. You're in their country. The example of Abu Ghraib is the most you know, pertinent and obvious example. And actually, do those things. Like, how can you dehumanize a person? Uh, to, to actually commit that torture, and, and it's phenomenal. But then, how do you? How I, mm -hmm. I can't fathom being the but CEO see. of of WellPoint or Anthem, and and, re and making you said five hundred thousand dollars a week, and your job is basically to prevent and health care, you know, national health care from passing. Uh, just how uh, the values the of that? How can you internalize your values to the point? Go home to your children and say, "Oh, what'd you do today, Daddy or Mommy?" Oh, well, I <laughs> enjoyed well, that. Exactly. Forty-five Keep in million mind, don't have health care. When we say words like CEO, government, corporations, they're uh, human beings. <coughs> As Eve said, <coughs> we're all human beings. We're all individuals. They are sitting around a table like this, much fancier. <laughs> a very swanky office, actually making these decisions to, to uh, torture people. And there's doctors hired to, to stamp Be refused. Because, uh, exactly. And I think torture basically is causing you to not have peace of mind. And oh. rather it's I, holding you down and waterboarding or denying you health insurance at all. You denied peace of mind. The stress causes all kinds of illnesses. Anyway, Chris, take it away with the American way. Okay, so it goes something like this. Tell you, they tell you that you gotta work hard. Tell you, they tell you to believe in their God. Tell you, they tell you not to have no regard. Rip it up, explode it, and you get a reward. Don't you worry, baby, it'll be okay. Don't you know, baby, it's just the American way. Tell you, I tell you that it's democracy. But you find out real soon that you ain't got no say. Lesson, lesson about how to get by. It's a better not fight. Better not try, you better, better just do what they say. Don't think too much and be sure to obey. Don't you worry, baby, it'll be okay. Don't you know, baby, it's just the American way. Well, you learn, you learn, you learn early on. This life is hard like a long slow burn. By the time, by the time that you realize that it's all, it's all an enormous life. It's too late. Uh, academic, PhD, activist, songwriter. Chris, uh, 
Tell us some um, about your experiences, like in Seattle and New York. We have about 20 minutes left in the show. Okay. Well, I, I won't be talking for 20 <laughs> minutes, but... No, no, but uh, <laughs> I just like give you a framework. The, well, the, the context is that we have a Bill of Rights which supposedly protects us in terms of expressing that we have a right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, etc. The reality is that I, as a very privileged white male, have <laughs> experienced <laughs> some very intense uh, handling at the hands of the police. I think the, the, the thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that this is a reality for many people of color every day in this country. So when I talk about my experience, it's an experience of, again, generally being in their exceptions, but the uh, Seattle, Washington, D.C., New York, these very large protests involving uh, thousands of people that are organized, have resources, etc. These, again, have resources, they have organizational backing, they have legal help, uh, they have people helping you once you're in jail, etc. But right now, as we speak, there are probably hundreds, perhaps thousands of people of color who are having their doors beaten down, beaten up, thrown in jail, have very little legal recourse, and may or may not be guilty. But the issue, again, is torture, and the issue is how people are, are actually handled, regardless of whether they're guilty or not. And when we talk about guilt, going back to my previous point, if you're guilty of drug possession, you know, is this really such a terrible crime? Uh, is it a crime at all? My, I've been arrested over 10 times. Uh, I've been arrested in Australia and in the United States and in Colombia. I've been arrested, mm -hmm. not sure, five or six times in the United States. And by far, the worst treatment I've had <laughs> as a protester is in the United States. Police brutality is not an oxymoron. Uh, it's a reality. In Seattle, at the WTO protests in 1999, protesting what I would argue is a very incredible form of U.S. torture, free trade agreements. Uh, there were thousands of us protesting, and to make a long story short, when we surrounded the convention center, we were able to shut it down. The police reacted. You, know, you have nonviolent protesters linking arms. Some people were, uh, were not able to use their arms, uh, myself included. People were, you know, pain holds, batons, and the worst thing was being held down and having the police spray, spray pepper spray into your eyes. This is, again, nonviolent protest, uh, fundamental constitutional right to protest. And of course, what you assume the police are going to do is to take you, take you to jail, process you, etc. But instead, they use a variety of, of pain, what they call uh, pain techniques, pain holds, etc., to so you won't protest. Uh, and so you'll leave and you won't be an effective agent of change. And I think that's why many people do not participate because they see the level of violence. And there's an association that if you protest, then the police are going to have this reaction. And of course, subliminally, you're thinking, okay, perhaps they're doing something bad, whether it's the police or the protesters, but who wants to be in that position? Uh, in terms of the conditions in, in jails, uh, in terms of the conditions of, again, Seattle is a good example. The, we saw the Guantanamo Bay protesters shackled, you know, to go from his cell to wherever it is they're interrogating and we're having the, the thing. I've been shackled as a not, as almost For you know, ludicrous to be talking. Yes, I was, my, quote unquote, I was charged with blocking pedestrian access to the sidewalk. And so, yeah, taken to this holding facility, held for days, finally see a lawyer, taken to uh, the court, and they're taking us downtown, and literally shackles the handcuffs, ankles, and a chain connecting the two. So, you know, you're doing that, that little oh. shuffle. And again, like, I must be quite a security risk for blocking pedestrian access to the sidewalk. This is uh, common. And it's really terrifying, again, the number of people, oh, the arbitrary nature of the criminal justice system, and the, and, and the intent, and the intent is to break people's spirit, clearly. And the intent is, if you ever threaten in any way the capitalist system, it will clearly uh, come down very, very hard. And whether, I would argue that Iraq threatened the capitalist system, the U.S. economic empire, and the U.S. came down very, very hard on Iraq. It comes down on protesters. It come do comes down on any institution which is able to effectively uh, argue or create or instigate social change. Wow. That's a lot of courage, and it also re reminded me of the courage that Martin Luther King did. I mean, his death threats, his um, ability to walk, 
hand in hand, nonviolently down avenues where people were tortured with them. Um, can, can I just add something to mm -hmm. that? People are doing that every day in this country, and but the, the media has changed. So basically the media, one of the things in terms of media coverage of the 60s true. was that you had Martin Luther King and the civil rights uh, protests being covered, and you had the police brutality being covered. You had the Vietnam War being covered, and so there was this collective consciousness of the nation being able to say, wow, whatever we are, we sure aren't that. I mean, at least the extremes were addressed. But now, in terms of the Iraq War, Afghanistan, is very, very controlled from the Pentagon. And in terms of protests, right now there are approximately 10,000 people in Detroit for the U.S. Social Forum. You will not read it about in the newspapers. You won't see it it's on true. the news. A Tea Party will have a few hundred people at a protest. Wow, you know, instant coverage. Yeah. So Good suppression point. of they're protecting information. protecting the values of the right. industrialist. Uh, right, and, mm -hmm. and showing essentially like, well, it doesn't exist. You know, no one's protesting. Like, yeah, there's some people in Detroit, some weirdo, you know. But the reality is that there's every day, and you, yourself is a good example, people working very hard to create social change or create change that is actually going to benefit people. And without that, we would you know, be in a lot more trouble. But essentially, the media perception is that activists are either bad or invisible. Yeah, uh, good, very good point. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. again, that labeling. and. I think Americans are just, as a generalization, but very fearful people. Oh, goodness, And, yes. and wars make them feel safe somehow. Uh, seeing the police beat up protesters makes them feel uh, order is restored regardless of what the issue is or what the protesters are actually doing. And the media has the power to portray it and slant it the way that they want it to be slanted. It, it gets back to the labeling that you talked about, Eve, the perception of things. And, uh, you know, fear fear causes you to, to prejudice, it causes hatred, it causes these labelings, and I think it causes you just to make up facts. I mean, as, as you need to make them up, whether it's health care or torture or Iraq, Afghanistan, you just make them up. And I unfortunately, think. we saw people making up facts during the last election uh, and also doing health care, you know, death panels. Um, yeah, exactly. I had a 91-year-old guy who was going to order a, a blood test for him. He says, oh, you know, so you don't worry about that because Obama's going to kill me anyway. I says, what? It's because, well, don't you know he's going to kill off all the old people? Where did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, like, it's just policy. Oh, my <laughs> and it, people, the I just encourage people. everybody to read and not just take what some news channel says for fact, death panels and et cetera, is to read, yeah. um, get other sources of information. Um, and think for yourself. Think for yourself and, uh, and don't get the sound bites. You know, these sound yeah. bites keep going on and on and on. Well, I, I do shudder to think whether there would be national support for a candidate who did run on the fact, let's kill off all the old people, uh, but fortunately we're not at that stage. Well, one of the, we mentioned the next theater for ideas are, is going to be on specifically on health care, and one reason is, is what we're talking about, that people, you know, just make things up about uh, in Canada, oh my gosh, you have to wait in lines. Oh, the expense is so great. No, okay. this and that. Which compared to not having any. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, 45 right. million people without, and I don't have health insurance. Waiting in line sounds okay to me. Yeah. But what's sad is that our politicians are, are blatantly lying. Yes. It, they come out of the meetings and blatantly lie. And yeah. if you read the facts, you will know that they're lying. But the media picks on it and it covers it. Well. I will they're say, all the same. I write <laughs> columns for the New Sentinel. I don't know if they're, they haven't printed this yet. Once in a while, they don't print what I send them, but I thank them for printing what they do, so thank you. But um, I wrote one called The Jury Pool. About a month, I don't know, three months ago, I got a summons to be on a jury, and it got me thinking. You know, the summons says, it's your duty as a citizen to participate in the system. Oh, fair enough, okay. And I thought, let's just choose all of our politicians that way. Yeah. Pull them out of the jury pool. No elections, because elections are rigged by these corporations. And you had mentioned the, the lobbyists. 
And I think before we close, we need to mention we have a system where you can buy politicians. You literally buy them. I mean, one reason that these people, men and women, make such horribly mean statements, lesser and all that, and vote against uh, bills that would help, <laughs> to, would, would would help people get jobs and vote the BP, against. The official who didn't think BP should pay back. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't <laughs> think they should have to pay. Uh, that that they're bought and paid for. I mm -hmm. mean, somebody that says that, you can be sure is getting big campaign contributions from BP. Like that lady said, oh, they, the, the taxpayers should bail them out. Oh, yeah. Well, the BP guy is off in England going to a yacht race. This is just the classic well, the example theater. of uh, what we're talking about. The, the, the media... Congress and be, you know they're all one and the same, man. Yeah, it's just like yeah, they are. They're one. They're one and the same. They all should wear those suits like those race car drivers wear. I swear. At least they're honest. You know, they get in their car. Their car's That's got all these sticker stickers <laughs> yeah. and stuff all over. You know, Exxon Mobil, Pepsi. Their mm -hmm. their suits have all this on. Congress just sit there in a hearing, and they should have all this the, wear yeah. suits like yeah, that because the, the, the they're owned by them. Yeah. Uh, the congressman from ExxonMobil will now take the stand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The co congressman from Pepsi now has two minutes <laughs> to, yeah. to talk. Uh, well, I think we're down, speaking of minutes, we're down to uh, minutes left, and we want you to sing one more song, and uh, you wanted to introduce it and talk about well, it. Well, are we at that? Uh, I think we got only got five minutes, so okay. uh, and we're just uh, going to close with you. So I want to say thank you, Chris, my brother, and Eve Bratton. I think you're two of the greatest Americans ever. Oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know Eve now volunteers at the new clinic down at the church, uh, helping people and well, serving them as you. a nurse. I mean, think about that. Uh, that's wonderful. And Chris, as we heard, has been all over making his voice heard, which is the essence still, I believe, of being an American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't just accept things and protesting does not make you anti-American. It makes you more American. Okay, Chris. Okay, so uh, this song is okay. called, this song is called Dope Smokers of the World Unite and Take Over. And while it could be, you know, perceived as having a bit of a curious or a humorous title and content, it's actually quite serious because, again, there are lots of people in jail for the... <laughs> uh, it's amazing that possession of marijuana or anything to do with marijuana or uh, these types of drugs can be considered criminal. So, anyway, it's called Dope Smokers Let of the World. Let me just say again, thank you to Amnesty International and to our crew here in the studio and in the control room for putting us on the air. Thank you all. Yeah, thank Chris. you. Okay, so. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.